thanks everyone for joining us. Um, I'm Jeannie Harrison of the Jeannie Harrison Law Firm. I'm a plaintiff's employment lawyer, and I'm president of Consumer Attorneys Association of Los Angeles. Um, I'm excited to welcome you to what is our follow-up from our uh, April 12th webinar regarding paraprofessionals and non-lawyer ownership of law firms. There were lots of questions um, posted during that webinar and we were not able to get to even close to all of them. So we decided to hold this round two webinar really to answer questions. That's what we're focused on is your questions. So get ready to post questions in the Q&A. Hopefully um, there may be some posted in the chat. We encourage you to post them in the Q&A. Um, we're going to try to get to your live questions as well as questions from last time. Um, we have our prior speakers joining us from uh, the first seminar, the April 12th seminar. Um, and this seminar is jointly sponsored by Beverly Hills Bar Association, LA County Bar Association, and CALA. I'm just going to give you a quick intro to our speakers to remind you who they are. Um, Marta Alcumbrak is a principal of the law firm Roby & Mathai. For the last 20 years, her practice has almost exclusively been dedicated to representing attorneys in negligence, breach of fiduciary duty, and fee dispute matters. She's a certified specialist in legal malpractice. She's currently the president-elect of the Association of Southern California Defense Council. She's a member of the Closing the Justice Gap Working Group and is on the SCOPE subcommittee. Erin Joyce of Erin Joyce Law spent 18 years as a state bar prosecutor and now specializes in defending licensed professionals, including attorneys, doctors, EMTs, and paramedics. She is currently the chair of LACPA's small firm and sole practitioner section. And she is chair of LACPA's Future of Lawyering Task Force, uh, she's also a member of California Lawyers Association's Future of the Profession Task Force, and I think I got all of those um, task force names right. Uh, and Carolyn Shining is joining us as well. If she can break away from a deposition, we're asking her to do double duty. She's the managing partner at Bars and Law Firm, uh, is a trial lawyer, and focuses her practice on plaintiff's personal injury, products, cases, and class actions. She is secretary of LACPA's small firm and sole practitioner section and is a member of the paraprofessional program working group. Um, Olivier Talia is a plaintiff's personal injury trial lawyer at the Dominguez firm. He's previously been nominated for trial lawyer of the year by CALA. Um, he's on the board of CALA. Uh, and has been active in organizing and public speaking uh, in front of the paraprofessional program working group. Um, plus, as a new speaker, uh, we are thrilled to tell you that we have uh, Dana Hadel joining us. She's the directing attorney for BetSedex Employment Rights Project Team. Um, most recently, she was counsel at CIFAR, uh, where her practice focused on employment discrimination, retaliation, and sexual harassment litigation, but I don't think Dana and I had a case against each other before. <laughs> so, at any rate, I'm really excited about this follow-up Q&A um, session, and we are going to uh, start, actually, with Dana, and I'm going to throw some questions to her. Um, so that hopefully, Dana, you can tell us about what um, Betsetic's position is regarding the paraprofessional licensure and why. Um, and so maybe you can start with answering that question. So Betsetic believes that all Californians deserve access to qualified legal professionals, um, qualified being trained attorneys um, and supervised paralegals. And there is a particular need for attorneys for low and moderate income earners who otherwise cannot afford an attorney. Um, however, uh, we have some uh, significant concerns about the paraprofessional uh, proposal um, that this program uh, could, um, and we believe will jeopardize 
access to uh, qualified legal professionals by diverting resources from legal aid and nonprofit organizations that provide free legal services. Um, the infrastructure of free nonprofit service providers already exists within the state. I am there. Uh, so instead of providing support to those organizations, this paraprofessional program gives legitimacy to profit oriented businesses, not subject to the same strict professional ethics and disciplinary codes lawyers must abide by to protect the public. Um, and and we remain confused as to why money should be poured into this, money and energy should be poured into this new and untested scheme rather than supporting um, the, the structures which already exist and specifically in the form of legal aid. Thank you so much for that. And then how, how exactly are you concerned about what what do you think is potentially going to be the impact for Beth Zedek if there if this licensure um, does you know get approved um, and if this I, I guess if this whole new system uh, this machine starts moving. Right. Well, we've seen in the past, um, you know, it, uh, workers come to us who have, I am, you know, been victims of notarios and other third parties. Like, for instance, right now we have, um, you know, we're seeing an onslaught of of individuals calling us who have been using third parties to um, help navigate the EDD system, and they're paying, um, you know, weekly amounts of, you know, up to twenty dollars, which might seem insignificant, but is quite significant when, you know, your subsistence, subsistence is limited to, uh, you know, unemployment insurance. And so, you know, we're see, we, we already see the impact of, um, you know, of unregulated and, um, you know, in other systems where, where, you know, our, our low income um, and non-English speaking clients uh, can easily fall prey, not realizing that there are free legal services available to them to help navigate um, you know, the legal system. Uh, you know, so so that is that's one of the primary concerns. Um, you know, the other concern is that is just that the focus should be on ways to make um, legal ways to increase the capacity of existing legal services um, and ways to make law school affordable so that people can go into legal aid and public interest. Okay, and so what has Betsetic done to communicate its positions to the state bar? Um, so we've been attending a lot of the uh, the meetings and providing public comment. Um, we also have, you know, uh, been you know signed on to and written our own letters, letting them know what our positions are. And it ha is does Betsetic um, intend to? also participate and communicate um, its position to the, um, to the closing the justice gap working group. So that's what I sometimes refer to as the sandbox group. Yes. Yes, absolutely. We intend, we intend to do so. And we're not on that working group, how, you know, or part of it officially, um, you know, however, we are in communication with, with folks there and we will um, make that, make that position known. Okay, great. And then um, are you able to tell us what you know about with regard to other legal aid or public interest organizations positions on these issues? So I, I can't speak on behalf of other other legal aids. Um, what I can tell you is that um, the my the counterparts with whom I've spoken at other legal aid organizations have uh, very similar concerns to ours, okay. um, and and are um, very uh, uh, very concerned about this program. Okay, um, thank you so much. And then I also want to ask any of the other panelists. This is the first time actually that each one of you has had an opportunity to ask a question of Dana. And so let me know if you do have a question of her, just speak up and, and ask any of your questions. We do intend this to be a very interactive discussion about Q&A. So, and then Dana, please do jump in and offer um, your perspective when we're talking about um, some of the other points and issues as well. Um, okay. So then one of the other questions uh, that was posted previously was, um, could you please 
uh, let us know what areas have been recommended for licensure. And we did go through those quite a bit during the, the initial program, but Carolyn, do you, um, do you wanna update people on especially the April 19th meeting and where yeah. we are? Yeah, the, um, the areas have been significantly winnowed down and um, we've gotten rid of, I think we've finally gotten rid of employment um, to the extent <laughs> I think it finally was everything was clarified that that is completely out. Uh, there also is no straight personal injury that's out. I saw some questions about that. Uh, personal injury cases uh, specifically are not included. Um, unemployment is being uh, unemployment is being considered as other administrative issues. Uh, family law is being included. Um, uh, there, there's a whole host of very small odd things. Um, expungements, which are some collateral criminal name changes. Um, uh, the, the, there's a whole host and, and we had them. And I think if you have that slide, Jeannie, there are still issues as to what inside those issues will be. Housing and family law, we're, we didn't have, we ran out of time to discuss those. So those will probably come up again at the May meeting uh, and may not even be finalized to the June meeting. Um, so it, it's really complicated. It's It's been a shifting um, playing field. And so, um, but, it, but things are in consumer debt and judgment enforcement is also something um, that's being discussed and probably will end up in it. And inside those realms varying, there are limited jurisdiction appearances, full scope being considered. So it's a shifting situation and you really need to pay attention because Every time we discuss an area, then some other area po pops up again. It's kind of championed by one person or another on the committee. Let me see. And to, and, and to, uh, yeah. uh, to, Car to Carolyn's point, and, and I think the, the reason why participation uh, is so important is that you know, we, we, we make progress. We think that the areas are being narrowed down. Uh, and then the next meeting comes along, and, and a lot of the work that's already been done all of a sudden, because of a proposal of one of the committee members, you start having to rediscuss all the same issues all over again. So e even the battles that have been won um, have not truly been won until, you know, the, the, the process is going to be over. So, you know, Carolyn has been instrumental in trying to limit the discussions into some of these subcommittee meetings. Everybody uh, on this panel has been instrumental in participating and providing public comment. But I, I, I will tell you, um, any opportunity that they have to sneak something in is an opportunity taken. And, you know, we, we've been vigilant about attending these meetings, about holding their feet to the fire. But it, it, it's that kind of pressure that's going to ensure that these areas remain as narrow as possible uh, in the future. And, you know, I don't know if, Carolyn, you want to expand on that. But, you know, that's that's been my uh, my observation in, in, in attending these meetings and everybody's shaking their head. So I guess yeah. you know, I'm not the only one. Well, I, I would say that the um, Utah is the, is the um, area that's, that's really moved this along as much as possible. And so they chose a couple of narrow areas, um, small claims, uh, unlawful detainer and, um, and some family. Um, but what really is happening is behind that is the other program, which is the leg uh, regulatory relaxation. So they have 12 entities that are in there and are asking for more, uh, to lift more restrictions. So what we're having in the paraprofessional is sort of a, a little mini outline. And then right behind it is going to be this other committee that I'm not on, um, that's going to be asking for res further restrictions. So that that's sort of, it's a one-two punch. And so the more people pay attention, um, you know, to, to these areas that are coming, because again, it, while personal injury is excluded right now, there are still some areas where limited jurisdiction is being considered and the all eyes will be on, how does that go? Um, is it a problem to have paraprofessionals in a courtroom? Um, do they, will they do okay? And, and so everybody's eyes are gonna be on the enforcement of judgments and, and these small um, consumer debt is, is in terms of your know, credit card debts, that sort of defense. Um, and lawful detainer in terms of, you know, the, the regular, but maybe even unlawful detainer uh, for small mom and pop um, uh, home uh, landlords. So it just, the eyes will be on the limited jurisdiction um, areas that are, that are really coming to the fore. Right. And so one of the questions previously also was, uh, what does it mean when uh, a specific area of the law has been excluded? 
And what that means is that through the paraprofessional working group subcommittees and then the full committee discussion, the committee has not voted to stand up a, um, a pilot program in that specific area of the law. So for example, um, by way of example, in employment at the beginning, they were considering including um, having a paraprofessional program for um, uh, claims associated with uh, wrongful termination, unsafe working conditions, sexual harassment, workers' compensation, workplace accommodations, um, wage and hour claims, um, claims in front of the labor commissioner, um, uh, unemployment insurance claims. So basically all of employment law. And I want to piggyback on what Olivier was saying about showing up at these meetings and making public comment. Um, as a result of the fact that we actually appeared at the meetings and made public comment regarding these employment issues, the subcommittee um, actually said, well, these a number of these different areas are too complex. They actually implicate federal law, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and lots of different reasons, right? Which we took the time to have experts come and explain. And as a result of that, the paraprofessional working group, the entire working group voted actually, instead of that whole smorgasbord of potential employment claims to stand up a, a, a program regarding um, and addressing, they instead decided that the paraprofessional would potentially be licensed um, just in representing employees in front of the labor commissioner, in unemployment claims, and then also to enforce um, uh, essentially awards in, from the labor commissioner only in limited jurisdiction. Um, Dana, it looks like you are wanting to say something. So what's interesting, though, is that currently you actually don't need to be an attorney to represent somebody in claims before the labor commissioner or in the UI process. So it is um, just reaffirming, uh, you know, the status quo for those for those. Right. And that was part of the discussion. And so the reason why I wanted to explain that and bring it up is, again, it may seem to some, I've, I've heard the feedback. I'll be honest, I've heard the feedback like, well, well, how much impact does it actually have for us to show up and give public comment? And shouldn't we be doing something bigger than that? Well, we are doing both and we need to do both, okay? So it is again, yes and. We need to show up on those smaller issues in the specific meetings and we need to give public comment. There are people on you know, these, these working groups and, and these subcommittees who are not familiar with these, I mean, some of them are not lawyers um, and they don't know, they don't know how they are potentially gonna be impacting uh, the rights of employees, the people that we all represent. And so we do need to show up and educate them about that. And it, we do actually affect perception, perspective and decision-making in those subcommittees. Um, and, and we do need to be fighting the bigger issues as well. And on that, um, uh, on, on that, so one of the other questions again was, you know, what does the sandbox mean? And Marta, I know you are uh, in process on the closing the justice gap uh, working group. And where, all, where are you now? Where is your working group now? And, and what is coming? Thanks, Jeannie. Um, okay, so it's important to keep in mind that there's two groups that the state bar is utilizing right now to examine these uh, the justice gap issues. There's the paraprofessional group that Carolyn is a part of, and there's the uh, closing the justice gap working group that I am a member of. And that group, the, the closing the justice gap working group just started its kind of tasks in January. And Carolyn, if I'm not mistaken, you guys have been at it for probably over a year now, right? Right, right. We started in April last year. Right. So, and the paraprofessional group is, is kind of wrapping up their work and should be done, I think by July with a report to come out. And if, if I'm not mistaken, in September, yeah, I think that's the trajectory. 
Right. And my group has about two years. Um, so we had, there's, the, you know, we're kind of getting these, getting up to speed here. And one of the things that we're, we're focused on right now is um, looking at this idea of a sandbox. And the sandbox um, has been utilized in Utah. It was also used, um, but uh, in Washington state, although in Washington, this whole notion has kind of, it, it sun, there was a sunset clause. They didn't have a lot of involvement um, from the community. So it kind of ended on its own. And now Arizona is also examining this issue and has actually um, passed uh, the Supreme Court in Arizona has allowed um, non-lawyer ownership of law firms. Um, so Arizona is in this, in this game as well. But the sandbox is really defined. I'm just going to read uh, the, what has been come out of the California State Bar. Um, and this is how, it's, it, how they intend it to function within the state, okay? It's a framework established by a regulator that allows participants to test innovative business models or offer products and services in a controlled environment under a regulatory supervision. And really what it's supposed to do is kind of allow participants to you know, offer legal services without being lawyers. And then what the regulators do is kind of assess what, can, what came out of that and kind of measure consumer harm. So it's really a backward looking um, framework. You know, as lawyers, we went to law school, we studied the rules of professional conduct. We know how to represent our clients within the framework of the rules of professional conduct. And that's how we govern ourselves. This is really kind of a, an experiment, a social experiment in the sense that it's going to be looking the other way. It's going to be, a, you know, after an application process for, um, you know, uh, that, uh, that a party or an entity would submit to the regulatory body, then they would um, be allowed to participate in, legal, in, in, in delivering legal services outside the norm, and then they'll see what happens. So it's really a giant experiment. Yeah, and I would just add, someone asked in the, in the comments, why is it called a sandbox? And a sandbox <laughs> is a computer programming term. And you, you do your computer programming in the sandbox, which is a computer away from your good computer. And hopefully it won't crash that other computer. So that, that's where the term sandbox comes, comes from. Um, and Marta, I really appreciate your conversation, your, your comments about your group, um, because that segues nicely into, um, I think, some comments and observations from Aaron. Right, because Aaron has a lot of really deep thought and perspective to share with us about what this all implicates um, from a regulatory perspective in regards to um, the impact on consumers and lawyers and the structure of this. Um, and I, I want to also, I'm hoping, Aaron, that maybe what we can do is send around uh, the LA County Bar Association's letter that you shared with us, which was an outstanding letter. Hopefully we can send to um, all of the participants, the attendees here today. So will you speak to what that was as well? So, um, yes. I mean, I would think all bar associations across the state and certainly LACBA as, as one of the leaders along with CALA and Beverly Hills Bar Association about being the major concern that we have is for public protection. The rules of professional conduct were adopted for one reason, and I think Marta already referred to this. They are not there to protect lawyers. They're there to protect California's consumers that need legal services. And they, they stand as how we govern the practice of law. We remain a profession, we are a business, but we have certain standards, these ethical duties, which when you relax these, these um, regulations in that sandbox, what happens in a sandbox and the reason why it's not connected to the rest of the computers is because of the disruption causes damage. And California consumers can't afford the kind of damage that will come. As a state bar prosecutor for over 18 years, every time I had a case that involved capping, which means the non-lawyers had ownership interest or were sharing fees with the lawyer, basically renting out the license of either a very, very young, unsophisticated attorney, a very, very old attorney that either couldn't or didn't retire when they should have, or someone who's disabled. The, the non-attorney right now needs a license. So they get a lawyer 
And then through that license, they're able to prey on California consumers. And at the end of the day, there's always missing money in a trust account. So the attorney gets disbarred almost always because missing money is a disbarring case. But who's making, who's making off? The non-attorneys. These proposals that are being um, provided are, are, and considered are basically going to cut out the middleman. These heavy marketers that set up a storefront um, will start collecting fees directly from these consumers, making all these promises, and then they can close up shop, take the money, and who's going to be out? All of these California consumers. These people don't have not invested three years in law school and a reputation. One of the ways that attorneys are governed is because re reputation is everything. The practice of law and the profession is all based on referrals. Marketing matters, but that's one of the most important ways to do it. If you're just Sunset Law Group one day and um, you know Rainbow Law Group the next day, because it doesn't matter, there's not, all you have to do is do some filings and then you just re-up. You don't have that kind of um, stoppage and requirements on the, practice, on the practice and provision of legal services. Now to, to, to Aaron's point, you know, and, and I really look at uh, the regulatory system, both including licensure uh, and, and discipline uh, as, you know, it's really a sticks and carrot uh, situation. Whereas, you know, the, the stick obviously are the rules of professional conduct, which require attorneys to act a certain way, which is very different from a mainstream business or a mainstream type corporation. Now, the, the carrot is our continued ability to practice law, right? And it's something that's been given to us uh, after years of law school, taking the bar and practicing in, in a given area. Um, and, and the reason why it works most of the times is because most attorneys uh, want to continue practicing law. And they understand that if they're going to violate the rules of professional conduct and breach their ethical obligations, the state bar theoretically is going to take away that license. Now, it's a big deal for attorneys because, like I said, three years, you know, four years of college, three years of law school, uh, taking the bar, practicing in your field of, of, of practice takes time, it takes money, it takes energy. Um, and most attorneys don't want to jeopardize that um, for a quick buck, right? And, and so the, the sticks and carrot works. When you're opening up a system that it effectively removes the stick, right? We're, we're, you know, they're talking about allowing non-lawyers, people that have not invested in their education, people that have not invested in their careers, uh, allowing these people to have direct contact with clients and generate fee as a result of, the, of that contact. Um, something goes wrong, they close up shop, just like Aaron mentioned, they close up shop, there's no loss of a, you know, no loss of a bar license, no loss of years of education, no loss of any of that. And, you know, a week later, they reopen shop under a different name, right? So, so the business model um, is going to be completely different uh, and will effectively eliminate the protections that are associated with the rules of professional conduct uh, applying to attorneys. And, and to Aaron's point, the, the rules of professional conduct are not designed to protect attorneys. They place ethical and legal duties on us, which make it harder to run a business, not easier, and which at the center of protect the interests of the client, both uh, in representation, in uh, maintaining the funds, in allocating, you know, dealing with liens and all those other issues. So, you know, the, 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 what the state bar is effectively trying to ram through this sandbox process is to completely rewrite the way that law is being practiced and the way that consumers are being protected by the rules that are currently in place. And so to, you know, to, to, to give it a cute name like Sandbox makes it, you know, makes it an easier pill to swallow maybe. But I, I think we need to be very conscious about the fundamental disruption and completely overhaul of the law and the practice of law as we know it through this little sandbox, uh, it's effectively a, a back door. So the, the, those are, you know, those are the, the magnitude of, of the issues that are being discussed here and the magnitude of the issues that the bar is actually considering uh, through these proposals. 
And so, and to that point, and I want Aaron to jump back in, but to, to that point, and um, I see a question or a comment from Iris Firo, who is also on the paraprofessional working group. Um, uh, yes, the, on the issue of regulation and qualifications and that kind of thing, there is a separate subcommittee for the paraprofessional working group that is outlining what they think the um, qualifications and requirements should be. And the paraprofessional working group is, is voting on the outline of what those qualifications should be. Right now, um, the qualifications, as I understand them outlined, are you either have to have a JD, an LLM, um, or you have to uh, have a paralegal certificate, as I understand them. And I'm not trying to misstate things at all. Um, and then they're saying that you'll have to have specific training on this licensure for about a, a thousand hours um, if you want to um, specialize in any specialize in any one of these hours you're probably going to have to do about 500 hours of work on the specialization um, however uh, no, you don't have to pass the bar no you don't have to pass an exam as far as I understand it today uh, in terms of what you're talking about and um, no also you as a paraprofessional you and I think that this is really key as the paraprofessional um, is, is not going to be supervised by an attorney. And the paraprofessional is going to be allowed to um, join with other paraprofessionals. The question is being debated about how many right para, para, paraprofessionals could join together to start a business. Um, and so some people are very uh, interested at at looking at this paraprofessional issue in a way that's decoupled from what the larger effort is um, and, and looking at the paraprofessional issue as a standalone. And that's the way that the state bar has, has tried to actually structure and frame this after the original ATILS committee is my understanding. Um, but in reality, from my perspective, I don't think that these things can be decoupled. Um, the non-lawyer uh, ownership of law firms is um, absolutely, you know, uh, the uh, you know sister to uh, the paraprofessional working group. Um, well, the paraprofessional program, and so the concept, because this is what's happening in other states, right? Um, is that the uh, the businesses that are not owned by lawyers. Um, stand up law firms and in concept, they're able to actually have those those businesses be staffed by paraprofessionals who don't have to be um, supervised by attorneys. So that actually is the big picture. Um, and, and from my perspective, and Carolyn looks like she wants to weigh in on this. <laughs> yeah, no, it's there. there are, and, and hi, Ira. Um, Ira and I agree on a lot of things. We disagree on a lot of things, but there's a lot of spirited, spirited discussion. And there, you know, everyone in the working group and the paraprofessional working group has really good intentions. You know, there are people here who understand and, and know there are problems with our court system and people do, do need help. Um, but I think what we have, and, and there will be, there is an immense amount of discussion of the regulations, the discipline, but it's changing every second. The May 17th meeting is really important. We're going to spend a couple of hours discussing fee caps, fee limitations, and some of the things that are going to be considered in our discussion as groundwork are statutory caps already included in the California code. I'm, I'm reading off court appointed council rates. Um, there's a demographic survey that we all took in 2017 when we were re-upping um, re for the bar um, that, that will be, and then data from a Clio uh, 2021 or 2019 legal trends report. So we're going to spend a lot of time on this area of licensure. And it's, you know, it, very nuanced views have been taken with regard to these past issues that have been discussed. Should there be fee caps? What kind of training should we have? How complicated should the bar exam be? It's all in one package. The, my, my troubles have been and become, we could have started easily looking at a couple other states that have done this and built on that. And instead we've sort of gone upside down and, and really built this, it's gonna be a super complicated program 
with each nuanced element designed to address all the problems that, that Olivier and Jeannie to say, oh, no, no, we solved that. We solved that. Read over here. So people have to pay attention. You know, everybody here, I will really welcome you. Pay attention to the details um, of this. It, it takes a lot of time. And, and I'm really glad everybody who's here is, is you know, helping to, to think through these things. So um, the, I, I'm sorry, I could, I could talk I forever. Know. And I'm kind of talking towards Ira a little bit. <laughs> so listen, let me, but let, me, let me throw this out to Aaron, right? Because one of the great questions, and a few people asked this question from the original webinar was, um, well, how does Business and Professions Code 6125 apply or not apply? And are these paraprofessionals going to have to have malpractice? And what about you know, these companies that own law firms but are not lawyers? What are they going to have to have malpractice? How is the consumer going to be protected? Um, and 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 so to that point, I'm just going to say Business and Professions Code 6125 reads as follows: No person shall have shall practice law in California unless the person is an active licensee of the state bar. Aaron, to you, what do you have to say about that? Okay, well, yeah, we're only licensees now because membership is, is you know, we bit the dust and we're no longer a unified bar. That, that ship sailed and that's part of why this is possible today. But under Business and Professions Code 6125 and 6126, which are the unauthorized practice of law statutes, there is not a clear definition of what constitutes the practice of law. It's all by case law. I'll tell you though, if you're standing next to someone in a courtroom and say, I'm here for Mr. X, that is definitely the practice of law. You cannot show up in a courtroom with a power of attorney and say, I'm here for grandma because she can't speak for herself because that's what lawyers do. We are representatives. And what's being considered with respect to the paraprofessional working group plans um, are basically to allow someone other than attorney to do that type of legal representation. I mean, I was actually listening in and watching the meeting when they were talking about full in-court representation, short of a jury trial. That's what's being considered and that's what they voted on as, as their default position. So imagine, I mean, my sense is, and again, having prosecuted many lawyers over the years, I don't believe four years of undergrad and three years of law school was just some kind of, um, you know, price to pay, like, like hazing. I think there's a reason why we have to go to three years of law school, personally, even a brand new lawyer, you know, newly minted knows almost nothing, not does not know enough to competently represent a client if they have fundamental rights that are at risk. That's the truth. That's the truth. And having seen and listened to the paraprofessional working group, talk about embedding in the curriculum of community colleges, that those kind of classes that are going to be necessary to become the specialist. And, and I was there when they're talking about specialists. So the, the concept as currently being um, explored is that say for family law, they're going to take that test, the test for the paraprofessional specialist, and they will be able to provide those specialized legal services, not as an attorney, but as a um, paraprofessional. And I think now, because they're kind of on to the point that it's that the first of all, the term paraprofessional is kind of unwieldy and it we're, kind of does. Aaron, Aaron, we're going to change it. We're going to change it. There was a marketing group. We had a marketing survey. The name is going to change. The name paraprofessional was not on the list of suggested options. So no, that name is going to change. It's going to be a legal license or a certified something, but well, it, we know weeks, the name will change. <laughs> we know we're not going to go with triple LT because we could see that didn't work well in, um, in Washington, Washington State, because there's 45 or 43 of them that made it through in, in um, what, five years, and now it's been sunsetted. So that's not going to work. And paraprofessional is too far away from lawyer, so we may not be able to confuse the public about that. So instead, my understanding is that we're going to be talking about legal advisor or advocate. I have prosecuted successfully as, a, as an attorney, you know, attorney for the state bar, people that called themselves advocates when they were out there preying on the helpless people losing their houses in the 2009 crisis. People out there, the public sees advocate as lawyer. So these people on the paraprofessional working group that are talking about naming are intentionally trying to confuse the public 
about the quality of legal services that will be provided. And I don't think it's too strong to say that. There are other options. If the real perceived problem, and I'm certainly one to agree that I've been to court and you've probably been there too when you've wasted the entire morning because the whole calendar is full of pro pers that do not know how to do it. Just like, I don't know how to fix my car engine guys. I have to pay for a professional and I can probably take the bus or do something else, but these people have no other choice. They need to get a child support order because they can't afford their rent. Okay. So there are certain basic subsistence legal services that are, that should be provided because of our society. It helps all of us societally and the society at the whole is, is going to be advantaged if we provide some minimum level of the services for people that have to go forward in a family law case are facing an eviction. Otherwise they're trying to do it themselves and all of us are paying the price because our courts are not efficient. Just like emergency rooms are not the best, best place to handle you know, a broken finger. There's urgent care, there's other options. These people don't have other options right now. And we as a society, I think it's time now to consider a basic right to counsel in certain civil matters. And that's the bold answer to this problem. That's the answer to access to justice. Not all of these other proposals, which are really there to take over the middle-class legal market. That's what these proposals all are about. And, you know, I want to tie into a couple of things that Erin said, because um, what she said was really important and, and including the fact that California is leaning, is looking towards Utah and examining these, these different options with the goal, of course, to serve the underserved, or at least that's the perceived goal is to serve the underserved or unserved consumers in California. But what's interesting about the Utah model, and I want to emphasize that there are two people on the Closing the Justice Gap Working Group who um, uh, were instrumental in putting together the Utah program and they're on the California's uh, you know, working group, um, which I find interesting. But regardless, there's no, there's no, uh, if you make it into the sandbox in Utah, you don't have to have any type of uh, bond, malpractice insurance, professional liability coverage or any kind of things. There's, no, there's nothing to really um, protect the consumer um, for any type of liability. And, you know, we can also, we can say that, well, you know, lawyers in California also don't have to have malpractice insurance, but, you know, it, it, this gives me great pause um, because, if you don't, for example, in Utah, the biggest con, uh, use of the sandbox participants is in end of life issues, wills, trusts, and states, those kinds of things. You're not gonna, those people aren't gonna find out, um, you know, it, whether or not their will got screwed up until several years later. And Olivia, um, you know, he, he touched on this. That, that entity that put together your will, that non-lawyer entity that put together your will or estate they may be gone by the time somebody figures out that Johnny was left out of the will. So then what does that family do? And how was that really serving or protecting the consumers in, in, in that state? And this is important issues that we need to stay on top of and we need to pay attention to. This will change everybody's practice. No, there will, there will not be a lawyer uh, untouched by these proposals. We have to you know, pay attention to what's happening. Yeah, absolutely. And mobilize. And so I want to go back to a point. I, I do just want to go back to a point which we started to focus on and Aaron started to focus on, which is that we're all now licensees, right, of the state bar, right? And so so what the what members of the paraprofessional working group have been talking about is all of the rule of professional conduct changes. Um, and uh, the statutory changes that will, will need to be implemented to uh, stand up this paraprofessional licensure program. But what I also want to point out is, you know, as to Carolyn's point, that um, pretty soon there's going to be a separate meeting that's, I think it's May, May 17th, is it? Or yeah, the May 17th meeting where there's going to be discussion about fee caps for this new licensure of paraprofessionals, right? And so what the state bar and the Supreme Court, which is the ultimate um, licensing authority for us, the ultimate regula regulatory authority for lawyers, what they're talking about is the ability to impose fee caps for one of their licensures. We're just another licensure, okay? 
And so um, if they can do it with paraprofessionals, they can do it with any of their licensures. And so some people argue, well, you know, even if they do it for, do the various things for paraprofessionals, it's really not going to impact lawyers, right? And um, although the rule change, the proposed rule change may not be directly to impact lawyers, the precedent that it sets, we really have to think through all of these things. And there's a lot of discussion that goes on about, well, having, you know, as little regulation as possible because there needs to be innovation. That discussion is happening in MARTA's group, right, all the time. That, uh, that regulation on companies that would um, come in and, and basically start these businesses that are practicing law, regulation on them would be prohibitive and antithetical to the innovation that this whole thing is trying to spur at this point. So there are so many mixed messages and really what goes to me, I just keep looking at what is the big picture perspective on this, right? Yes, there are access to justice issues for certain people, right? And certain segments in California of society in California. And there are very clear ways that we could have a very positive impact on assisting with those those you know representative those segments of our society but what is behind this whole movement because it's happening in every state and it's coming from across the pond so to speak is simply business being able to practice law that's what that's what's behind this and they've packaged it nicely in this whole concept of access to justice and we talked about that a lot in the initial webinar so um, I wanted to make those points. And, uh, and then also, I think we really need to turn to, I know Aaron and Dana, you both have thoughts about what are the things that we can actually do to affect positive change? So either one of you. So I'll jump in if it's okay, Aaron. I wanna actually start by just, and I wasn't part of the initial conversation about the, um, the access to, the closing the justice gap study, but I actually participated in that study and we were not, um, you know, I, I had, it was a several month long period where during each one of my case reviews, I had to, you know, assess, um, you know, and write down basically reasons why I wasn't taking certain cases. Um, and we were not told, uh, you know, what this was going, you know, what, what it was going to be used for. Um, it was, you know, all out of context, really. And I, I, um, then read the study. And I will tell you that it was not reflective of any of the work that my colleagues and I had done. So it, it you know, was really very interesting that, you know, we, you know, we were under the impression that we were, um, you know, completing, um, you know, questionnaires to show that we didn't have adequate resources to provide legal services to everyone. And, you know, with the understanding that maybe we would get more legal resources. Um, you know, so I think that, you know, having been part of that study and having, you know, all of the information that we provided um, taken out of context, I think that that is is, um, and, you know, and having the study not really reflect what, you know, what we contributed. And obviously, I only contributed a small part to it. Uh, you know, that is, that's interesting. Um, you know, but as far as access to justice goes, um, you know, one I've, you know, one of the issues is the affordability of law school and that, you know, so many people take out so much debt um, and loan forgiveness is limited and people need to be able to pay it off. And how can you pay it off when you have a starting salary that's just slightly above twice the minimum wage, which is what so many first year, you know, attorneys at legal aids are, are earning. And, um, you know, and they're, you know, living it basically that, you know, just slightly above. Um, you know, the, the levels that our clients are at, right? And, and, you know, maybe one of the answers is to make law school more affordable, um, it, possibly, or to create more loan forgiveness or have, you know, a third year where, you know, where folks are, instead of going to law school, working at legal aid under the supervision of attorneys and being able to earn money at that same time, and so not incurring as much debt. There are other answers, 
right? This is, you know, this is an answer that is not responsive to the question. Um, and I think that that, you know, from where we sit, that's what we see. Um, you know, I can tell you that, um, you know, and, and I was telling the panelists earlier, I'm one of eight advocates um, I, that uh, where we have, a is uh, has the only workers' rights project in Los Angeles that does not take LSC funding, which means that it is eight advocates um, that can represent undocumented individuals in wage actions in Southern California, eight of us. Um, and, and, you know, there's, we say no a lot more than we say yes. Uh, you know, so maybe the answer is increasing capacity by giving, you know, by providing more funds for legal aid, because, you know, we are the answer to closing that justice gap. I couldn't agree more. Other states already require a kind of um, several, you know, so many hours of work. So it helps the newly minted lawyer get that um, practical experience and it directly impacts the um, justice gap as most people understand. Most people understand the justice gap to mean the people that can't afford lawyers that otherwise are at public counsel or epithetic or trying to do it themselves. That is not how the study that, that um, Donna was referring to has changed. And um, I would say stretch the concept of access to justice. Um, because, because this group really wants to expand the advertising rules, which they tried and they were unable to succeed um, with respect to the last rules revisions committee. And the idea of convincing folks that really the problem that at every income level, this is the, this is, the rationale, um, people don't understand the legal problem they have. They just, they, don't, they thought they had bad luck or they had a mean boss, that they have a real legal problem. We need to now instead heavily market to them. We need to be able to relax all the advertising rules. So the legal marketers now can start besieging your phone by the text messages and, and relax solicitation rules. And that's how they have changed the concept and change, try to Really, they're not concerned at all about the people at the line at public counsel. Yeah. They want the middle class legal market that can pay legal fees. And the way that they're going to get those um, serve, get those clients is because they're going to be able to um, do the heavily marketing outside of what's already allowed um, with the restrictions on legal marketing. So they have seen the justice gap issue as, oh, we need to convince people they have legal problems that they don't otherwise recognize. Right. And then and then convince people that they have these, you know, that they have these legal issues, but then go to paraprofessionals who might not be able to recognize, you know, all of the legal issues facing facing folks. So, you know, when we start to talk about, um, you know, paraprofessionals being able to represent individuals before the, the Labor Commissioner, which, as I you know, already pointed out, you can already represent somebody before the Labor Commissioner without a law license. Um, you know, but at least when I have, um, you know, a, a, a law student or a clerk or a, a paralegal, um, you know, or even an organizer with whom I'm working, who's, you know, working as an advocate on behalf of one of our clients, I'm reviewing everything so that when somebody comes to us and says with a wage claim, we can look at this and see, okay, you have a wage claim, but also there's an immigration related retaliation, uh, you know, issue. And also there's some disability discrimination and also, 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 right? And so, you know, if you're not trained in issue spotting, you're not going to see all of the issues. Um, and so you're only going to, to see that narrow, the, the, you know, the narrow piece. And, and then when you enter into a global settlement, you're then waiving all of your rights. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's a serious concern of ours because I can't tell you how many times clients come to us. I'd say that, that you know, nine times out of 10, when a client comes to us with one issue, you know, I can, I can point to three more issues that are there. I, I really, really appreciate your, your input, Dana, because it's, it's um, we've appreciated your comments and the comments of public counsel 
And, and there are a lot of things. I mean, I really just, again, I'm going to sound like a broken record. When people come and give public comment, as small as it is, it really impacts our discussions, you know, in that meeting and, and meetings to come. And, and some of it is, is being, um, you know, summarized inside our memos. Um, two, um, Ira made two questions <laughs> and they're really good questions. I really appreciate it. And, and you know, he's a, a very informed member of our committee. Um, there are, um, you know, the, um, the way in which the regulations are being looked at right now is a, a manner in which it took 25 years or l the last revision took 20, no, took five years to really go through before any year at the Supreme Court before we got the 2018 adoption of the ABA. And Aaron can speak more to this. Um, but, you know, at the, at the May and the June meetings, we're going to fly through things that the ATELS group didn't know how to do. And they had two ethics specialists um, that were examining everything on that group. So, you know, some of the things that Dana mentioned, um, you know, it's those those issue spotting things. Oh, I know what it was the area. Ira, you said, um, what about J? They are contemplating, you know, have to be JD, you have to have, you know, an LLM. You can do that as a minimum, uh, a minimum standard. So again, there's, these are some of this is super nuanced, but this is our group. This is what we're talking about, the paraprofessional. It's the group that Mart is on. And I think the one that, that's Jeannie and Olivia are talking about that really, you know, again, you've got to pay attention to these things. In addition to fee caps, we're talking about referrals. When does somebody, is it somebody able to refer from a paraprofessional to a lawyer? How do we judge that? How do we turn that? How do we keep that from being capping? And one of the hardest things, you know, Ira and a couple of other of us who are lawyers, there are, you know, they're several, many lawyers on the committee, but many non-lawyers, and you say things like capping, and then you say fee caps, and they're totally different things. So, <laughs> you know, we don't spend a lot of time um, going into those different issues, and it's tough because the SEDA comes in, public counsel comes in, you know, different organizations come in, and just kind of this issue, that issue, that. This is a big picture thing. And, it's you know, this, yeah, go ahead, Olivia. No, I, and I did want to address this because it's one of the issues that's actually popped up in Arizona. So there, there are strict restrictions uh, on attorney direct contact with potential clients uh, in, in the rules of professional conduct, essentially disallowing the practice of capping. And, and what capping means, at least in the personal injury context, is, ha is having uh, contact unsolicited uh, with someone who's not related to you or someone who doesn't have any affiliation. Uh, in order to in order to get the case. And, and so what ends up happening, and this is a practice which unfortunately already exists, is that you'll have hospital employees, uh, individuals who have access to hospitals who will literally walk the halls and identify individuals who've been injured and then reach out to them and in whatever condition they're in, have them sign uh, an engagement letter with a firm. That, that, that practice is capping. It's illegal in California. You will lose your license for it. Um, and already, even with the rules that we have, unfortunately, um, there's been instances of that. Um, the the uh, removal of restrictions on, uh, on only having attorneys um, practicing law is already having an effect on that in the state of Arizona. So we've seen, you know, personal injury law firms or personal injury attorneys that have partnered up with individuals who are cappers. There's no other way to no other way to characterize it and who are now part of a system that allows the sharing of fees between non-attorneys who are out there in the field, uh, contacting potential clients, signing up potential clients uh, and the attorneys with whom they've partnered with. And from a consumer protection standpoint, the, the, the practice of capping is um, is horrible. Uh, it, 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 it literally preys on the most vulnerable individuals out there at their lowest possible time in their lives when when they're truly in need of help. Um, and, you know, allowing non attorneys uh, to practice law would essentially legitimize that practice like it has uh, in Arizona and and create, you know, and uproot if you will, um, the legal advertising or the, you know, sort of the, the, the legitimate advertising uh, that is being done by attorneys who have a license and who want to keep their license. And so, you know, there are very, there are very strict rules about advertising. And I saw a comment earlier about, um, you know, most attorneys do the right thing because it's the right thing. And, and, and I acknowledge that. 
But the, the, the advantage and the benefit of having very clear rules on attorney advertising is that it makes sure that everybody plays on a level playing field. Right. And the state bar has procedures. If you if you see somebody who's advertising the wrong way, you can you can submit a complaint and very quickly the bar will actually um, get involved and send out a communication to the offending attorney and, and the advertisements will get taken down. So, you know, we're talking about completely uprooting this system of, of legal and fair um, and respectful to consumer advertising with a system that takes advantage of people at their lowest possible time. So and this is this is happening. So I, I know we've got to close it up because of the fact that we're running out of time. But one of the last real points that I want to make clear to everybody is that um, the regulation enforcement and the prosecution, so the enforcement of whatever the new rules are, that's going to happen for, through the state bar. And so there is a lot of discussion about, well, wait a minute, the state bar has an abysmal record. Um, you know, uh, prosecuting certain people and policing certain people as lawyers um, and, and not others. Um, and so, and it has limited means and that is the case. And so- uh, And, Je and Jeannie, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. That might not happen. It might go to another agency. There's so much here. There's yeah. so much here to really so think through and think about. There is also that discussion, I think, that, you know, Marta's- uh, working group is having too is is this going to be um through an agency or organization outside of the state bar a different department all that kind of stuff um but part of the discussion in the paraprofessional working group has been uh you know the the prosecution and enforcement of all of these various rules that are theoretically going to be implemented um and prosecution by the state bar so it's just there are just so many different layers and moves and changes. And just because there's one position being taken by the paraprofessional working group doesn't mean that that's the position that's going to be adopted by the board of trustees or by the, the uh, closing the justice gap working group committee. They may decide that they don't like what has been recommended on certain things by the paraprofessional working group. We just don't know. There are too many things in flux. And that's why we need everybody to remain part, you know, remain active and participate in these meetings. Um, it is not a small thing. It's a big thing to participate, be active. And there is no doubt. Um, I have also seen some comments about um, many uh, um, nonprofits getting together and um, staying on top of this and, and you know, organizing collectively. And I'm, I fully intend and hope that the bar associations, the affinity bar associations, the nonprofit organizations, we are all gonna be able to be aligned on a lot of these big picture issues and um, hopefully be able to communicate that alignment and some joint positions to the state bar. Um, so I just really appreciate everybody's hard work, your willingness to be here again. Dana, your willingness to join us today. It's been wonderful having you here and, and being able to hear from you about your perspective at Betsetic. And um, I think with that, we've gone over by a few minutes already, five minutes, but thanks to everyone. And um, y'all have a great weekend. Okay? Thank you. All right.